This is the School Success Podcast, a podcast for school leaders to learn from other school leaders what's working and what's not, and to get inspiration and encouragement, as well as strategies to grow school enrollment, connect with families, retain teachers, recruit teachers, and everything in between. You guys are heroes, and I cannot thank you enough for pouring into this next generation that's coming behind us. My goal is you will take at least one thing away from every episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. Please enjoy the School Success Podcast. Hey, School Success Makers. Today, we're joined by my new friend, Dr. Danielle, who runs an organization out of the great city of New York. I'm not going to spoil anything in this intro because we dive into all of it on the episode, but this is a special guest and a special episode, so I hope you enjoy this next episode of the School Success Podcast. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the School Success Podcast. I'm your host, Mitchell Slater. I'm joined by a new friend of mine, Dr. Danielle Moss-Cox, who is the CEO of Oliver Scholars in the great city of New York City, New York. I'm so stoked to have her, and I've been playing some tag and had to reschedule a couple of times, which is on my side. So I'm stoked to finally get this interview, and I know you guys are going to get a lot out of this one. She's doing some amazing things. She has a TED Talk, so please Google that one and find it on YouTube. She's doing some awesome things, but I don't want to take any thunder away from her. So I'm going to let pass back off to her and she can talk a little bit about herself. So Dr. Danielle, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Mitchell, for having me. This is such a pleasure. I love it. Well, you're in New York City. And I think what I'd love to know is, I, as I mentioned to you, I've never been to New York City. So in your opinion, what is the best place to go to for food and what's the best place to go to for fun? I like to just walk the city. <laughs> Whether you're walking in Central Park, Broadway, Times Square, there's always formal entertainment by way of Broadway and street entertainment, which sometimes can be a lot more fun. In terms of food, no matter what the neighborhood is, you can always find something good. One of my favorite restaurants in the city is Patricia's in the Bronx. Great Italian restaurant, definitely worth the trip to one of the outer boroughs. All right, I will make note of it. And I, as I told you, I gotta come around Christmas time as my goal one day to go up there and just embrace the festivities, like all those Christmas movies that have been based in around that Christmas time in New York City. It's just like reliving it. I'd see it in person would be really, really cool. So I gotta go, I gotta make it happen. And I'm in, I'm in Florida. So really it's only like a day's drive of 20 hours to get there in one day if I really want to. Oh yeah, just 20 hours. <laughs> one day, we'll make it up there. Obviously I've read your bio and on the website, You've done a lot of things and you've been involved in a lot of stuff. I'd love if you could, you don't have to share all of them. I know that would probably take a while, but some of the highlights of your career to kind of get you to the point that you've been in, that you're currently in, I'd love to hear some of that background for the guests. Sure. Well, I started my career in education and social justice as a middle school teacher in the Bronx. I taught sixth, seventh, and eighth grade English language arts and history. And that experience kind of changed the trajectory of my career. Shortly after I started teaching, I also became an assistant principal at the same parochial school. That led me to Teachers College, Columbia University, where I, you know, focused on leadership and organizational design. And then I got the nonprofit bug, you know, as a kid in New York, I had participated in all kinds of programs connected to the nonprofit sector, but never really thought about it as a career track. But once you're in it, it's such a vibrant community of professionals who, you know, cared about the same things that I cared about, were passionate about equality and justice, and whether my friends are working in healthcare, education, the legal profession, there are all these intersections that have really broadened my perspective and I think made me even more effective over the course of my career. Awesome. And obviously now you've, I think you've been at Oliver Scholars for, I think since 2019, is that right? Three years now? Yep. Three years. So how did that all come about that you found this organization and got involved there? Well, you know, the interesting thing, because the nonprofit sector is such a tight knit community in New York, I was familiar with Oliver Scholars for many, many years. I'd had the opportunity to work at the Center for 
talented youth at Johns Hopkins University and developed a partnership with Oliver in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I would say of all the jobs that I've had, this organization most closely mirrors my own educational journey. I didn't have the benefit of an access organization. I like to say I just had my mom, who was a fierce warrior, and I attended an independent day school here in New York City that set me up to attend a college like Swarthmore and then Columbia. And so in some ways, this organization was so familiar. So when the search folks reached out to me and said, you know, you have this amazing background, we would love you to consider this opportunity. It gave me an opportunity to just kind of like get grounded again in the kind of educational direct service delivery that has really been one of the hallmarks of my career. Awesome. And for those listening in, obviously, you know, we're on the, the School Success podcast, lots of school leaders that listen in and tune in and those that we've interviewed, those that are hearing this one right now and hearing Oliver Scholars and they don't know what that is. I'd love to kind of just take a thousand foot view maybe of what Oliver Scholars is and why it's a why it's an organization. Sure. So Oliver Scholars was founded in 1984 by a remarkable guy named John Hoffman, who I don't think was 25 yet at, at the time that he founded the organization, but he himself had attended a boarding school and was doing some volunteer work here in New York City and came across some remarkable high ability students who were set to go to their neighborhood schools. He was a tennis coach and most of those schools didn't have tennis programs. And so he went back to his alma mater and he said, you know, I'm encountering three incredible high ability black students and now we serve a benefit from the kind of education that this school provides. And I wonder if you'd meet with them and and talk to them and maybe there could be some financial aid opportunities and a way to, you know, more richly diversify the school community. And so about 500 Black and Latinx students, we're intentional about that because Black and Latinx students are the most underserved in our school system, the, the least likely to be identified as gifted and talented regardless of their test scores and academic performance. We know that a lot of that has to do with institutional and teacher bias. And, you know, we want kids to have access to the best education that can meet their educational needs, aspirations, and talents. So that's kind of what we do. We identify kids in seventh grade. Our students have to have a 90% average or above, be performing above average on state standardized exams. There's a rigorous interview process. We get about 1,100 nominations every year. We can only accept about 70 students, so it's fiercely competitive. We wish we could do more because there are so many bright kids who are often overlooked in their communities. You know, most schools are judged by how much progress the students who have the most challenges make over the course of a school year. There's not a lot of pressure to make sure that you are opening up access and opportunities for kids who demonstrate, you know, high ability, adaptability in terms of their academics. And so in communities of color in particular, these students tend to be largely overlooked and, and limited in terms of the rigor that they have access to. And so we work with those kids over 14 months two summers, a year of Saturday classes. We are delving into learning skills, how to study, how to take notes, you know, how to do research in the classroom, how to be an active participant in your own learning. As my staff like to say, we don't do sage on the stage classes at Oliver. We really want kids to be engaged and involved in supporting each other in asking critical questions about the content and really just getting fired up about the, I, learning. And they are incredibly remarkable. I love this. So since you mentioned the tennis thing back when it was beginning, are we just talking academics of kids that are excelling or kids that are really good at a sport, but they maybe need additional help with the academic side to excel even further? Yeah, no. So, yeah, so we are you know, mostly focused on the academic piece. 
obviously because of the kinds of independent day and boarding schools that we're able to, able to partner with, our students have all kinds of extracurricular access that many of them would not have been able to participate in in their local schools. So that's an added benefit, but the, the goal is really to, to begin to shape the next generation of leadership for our country and make sure that it's diverse and reflects the actual face of America. And our students go on to do incredible things. Obviously, there's a 100% high school graduation, pretty close to, you know, 100% college graduation over five years. 30% of our students go to Ivy's. 85% of our students go to schools ranked in the top 100. They are lawyers, they are doctors, they are leading in the social sector, they are leading in government, just having a remarkable impact on their communities and the world. And you mentioned seventh grade, so they work with you guys for that little bit then. Is there any touch points with them throughout the rest of their high school career and on to college? Oh, absolutely. So it's really a 10 year continuum that starts in middle school. During their high school years, each student is assigned a counselor who really is helping to make sure they are on track academically, social, emotionally, so that they can be successful in their you know, college aspirations. We provide college counseling, access to internships and other special opportunities and leadership opportunities. We have an annual service day all of our high school students have to complete a minimum of 150 hours of community service. And uh, once they're in college, right, we know that Black and Latino college graduates tend to be underemployed, regardless of what schools they've had access to. Some of that, again, points back to institutional and systemic barriers. But also, it's about building social capital so that you have the relationships and the guidance and the sponsors that you need in order to get the kinds of professional opportunities that we know our students are ripe for. And it sounds like it's working with your uh, success rate you just mentioned. So it sounds like it is, you guys have figured out the system and figured out how to help these kids get to that next level. I'm, I'm assuming, right? It's working really, really well. Yes. Yes, it is. The class of 22, I just have to shout out. To date, our, we have about 60 seniors this year. They have collectively garnered $9 million in scholarship and financial aid support for college. So they're bringing it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And so I know you mentioned some of the different jobs that they're into now. You got some of their doctors and lawyers. Is there anybody that's, I mean, you've been since doing this since the 80s or the school's been doing this since the 80s. Are there any like really big prominent people that people would know that you're able to share? I know I'm putting you on the spot with this question here. You'd be like, oh, so-and-so that you guys might know who's in the movie star or he's a politician or something is was going through scholars. Well, actually one of our current deputy mayors is an alum of the organization. Shout out to deputy mayor, Sheena Wright. Also one of our trustees, Shirley Romerick is an actress and just did an episode of The Equalizer, which is a show on CBS. We have another alum, Tanya Wright, sister to Sheena, who starred on Orange is the New Black. And they're also making inroads in the corporate sector and investment banking, private equity, hedge funds, a really just diverse group of folks. Even one of our peer organizations called A Better Chance is actually led by an Oliver alum. So, you know, there's no corner of achievement where our students haven't had some impact. And do you guys come beside the, obviously, there's a ton of schools in New York City. So a couple of questions with this one is just, is it only New York City that is the first one? And, and then beyond that, are you guys going into schools to talk about what you do? Or is it like, hey, we don't really need more names because we already have 1,100 we have to go through and weed it down to 70. So like, we don't want to go into schools, but like, how does that partnership between you and the districts work? So we do a great deal of outreach to local schools throughout the five boroughs. You know, I think it's about information. Even students who aren't selected get a list of resources and peer organizations that they can take advantage of. I think even going through the application process and learning the ins and outs of 
what it takes to secure a spot at a rigorous high school, whether it's independent or public, is important. And we also are really proud of our nomination process. So I think, you know, typically programs like ours might require students to obtain a nomination by a teacher or a principal. But we know that people get information in different ways. So families can nominate students who they think could benefit from our program. Your church leader can nominate you. You know, if there's a trusted adult at a, another nonprofit organization that provides other kinds of services to families, we want them to know that we're here and available. So students find us in all kinds of ways. Lots of word of mouth, but we have an admissions team that physically, you know, when we're allowed to, the last couple of years have been very interesting, that goes out into the community to make sure that parents are aware of all of the options that are available to them. All the guests I've been interviewing, you know, have been school leaders, and I ask him some of the same three basic questions that I wanted to kind of ask you as well. So challenges. I know obviously you, every school has challenges. I'm sure you guys are even up against the same one. I mean, you mentioned 1,100 students. You have to wheel, you know, get it down to 70. That's a challenge, I feel like, as well. But what are some other ones? What would, what would you say with some other challenges you guys are up against? You know, I think we're a nonprofit organization, so we rely on the generosity of supporters. And a lot of that typically happens through building relationships in person. So as a nonprofit leader leading through a global pandemic, it's been really interesting trying to figure out how to connect with people during such a difficult time. You know, we also saw, you know, kind of social outpouring that followed the murder of George Floyd. We saw our students becoming activists and really spurring on conversations at their schools about curriculum and, you know, what it means to be educated in America and, you know, what that constitutes and whose experiences are reflected in the curriculum and, you know, the politics and the social discourse around all of that has definitely had an impact on the organization. And then, you know, you pointed to something quite clearly, right? There are so many amazing students and organizations like ours have limited capacity based on our current strategy. So we're always thinking about if we can't serve, you know, 100,000 kids, right? Because we're in the biggest school district in the country. We're also in the most segregated school system in the country. That's New York. It's not Mississippi. It's not Alabama. It's not, you know, some of the southern states that have an enslavement history that people would think about in terms of segregation. So we want to think about how can we take what we've learned in 38 years and amplify big ideas around diversity, equity, and inclusion as they apply to educational institutions so that you don't need an Oliver Scholar, right? At some point, you know, we have a, a system that is equitable, that, that is just, and that is committed to the success of every single student that it serves. So, you know, we would love to put ourselves out of business by solving some of these big problems. Man, I've never heard that put that way, but I love that. So Dr. Danielle, she's like, I want to be put out of business because the system is so good that we are just not needed anymore. And I, yeah. that's, I mean, heck, I can't, I can get behind that. I love, I'm sure you'll be able to find another job, no problem, by the way. So <laughs> you have to worry. I hope so. <laughs> or maybe that's retirement. My time. family like, hopes so. I'm not built to sit around the house anyway. So yes. <laughs> And I know you brought up the point, you know, this last couple of years, especially for you guys with COVID there in New York City. How is that right now currently? I mean, as we record this, we're in, you know, the month of May, depending on when this episode actually gets, you know, aired. But are you guys kind of back to semi to normal? I know you guys have been the one that's... Yes. Yeah, so, so we're back in person, which was really important to our young people. We had a cycle of young people who did their entire admissions process, their entire scholar immersion process, which was that 14 Mac Academy, all virtually, and you know hadn't had the opportunity to really meet any of their new friends face to face. We're also, you know, really having to contend with 
the impact of the pandemic on our young people's emotional well-being that you know we're not built for that level of isolation and so obviously we want to keep everyone alive and safe but you know have really relished this opportunity to kind of like be back in community with people in person and we hope that the nation i know we're in the middle of a surge at least here in new york will kind of keep on that healthy trajectory so that some of the interactions and traditions that really are a hallmark of the organization are things that we can continue to do in person. I hope so too, because I love being back in person. I'm a huge extrovert. So to be away was like crazy. My wife was like, eh, this is all right. And I was like, that's because you're an introvert. I want to be around people really bad. I miss being in person at church and all that stuff. That was my biggest, was a huge miss for me. The next section talking about is my favorite ones where you get to brag about your school, your organization. So what's going really, really good. I know you've already shared some really, really good ones. So maybe you have to repeat yourself, but giving you a chance to share us about some huge wins that you guys are really proud of. You know, I'm going to give you a different kind of win. And I just want to shout out my staff and the board of trustees because they have really use these last couple of years as an opportunity to really lean into and think about the mission and build a high level of consciousness about why we do what we do, how we do what we do, how we can be better, how we can share our message. And, you know, I feel like my staff worked twice as hard actually during the pandemic because they wanted to make sure that our young people were okay. And my board wanted to make sure that our young people were okay, but they also thought about the staff. You know, there's a lot of vicarious trauma. We talked a lot about the educational impact of remote learning, but we may have missed some opportunities to really think about the fact that it wasn't just educational gaps that our students were seeing. Some of our students were sick, some of their family members were sick. Some of their family members passed away. Some of our parents lost employment during this pandemic. And so there was a ripple effect for our community. And I'm glad that I'm part of an organization and a community and have partnership with a board that really kind of looked at the whole community to figure out how we could stay connected and take care of each other. I love it because that community is so important and especially having a team that's by your side and by the, obviously all the kids' sides during that whole time. I feel like you guys kind of embody like a second family for a lot of these kids and for the staff. Would you kind of say that that's probably accurate? Yeah, I think it's true, right? If you're a part of an organization for 10 years, the power of the relationships that you build with your peers, with the staff, um, with the organization. I love our alumni. They come back, they volunteer, they share their experiences. They worry about our current scholars. Are they okay? What can I do to help? I've had the privilege of working in this sector and, and being a part of some amazing organizations, but there's just something special about Oliver Scholars, and I'm so proud to be leading the organization in this moment. Love it. Well, as we do kind of wrap up the episode, I always end with my last kind of final question. This could have multiple pieces to it if you want, but you, cause you've been in education for a while, you taught and you obviously grew up there in New York, but a piece of advice that you want to leave with the listeners. And again, mainly listeners are all school leaders, but a piece of advice or anything that you'd want to leave with them before we sign off. You would say this is exhausting work. So first I want people to take care of themselves. Our community suffered an unspeakable loss a couple of weeks ago when one of our teachers, who was a vibrant part of this community, took his own life. And I think the people make the work possible and we can't be so focused on young people that we're not creating opportunities to attend to the well-being of our teams and ourselves as workers. So we talk about healing a lot as an organization and making sure that the same things we want for our young people in terms of wellness are reflected in how we engage the people who do the actual work. So that's one thing that I would say. The other thing I would say is think about who's not in the room. 
my TED talk was about the forgotten middle. And even though Oliver scholars are uniquely academically exceptional, that doesn't necessarily reflect all of the young people whose lives I've had the chance to touch over the course of my career. As school leaders, sometimes you're focused on the lowest performing students and celebrating the highest performing students, but most of the kids are in the middle and they're waiting to be seen, you know what I'm saying, for their presence to be reflected in how the organization, the institution sets priorities. So I like to think that every young person in your school building has one adult, just one. You don't, you can't be everything to all the people, but everybody deserves to have one adult who is invested in their success. And the third thing I would say is, you know, I used to say to teachers, sometimes the teacher's lounge is the most dangerous place in the building for kids. Having been a teacher, I know that's where a lot of people use that space to vent, to complain, to share stories about students that color how other people in the building respond to them and see them. And so I want every teacher's lounge to be a healing space for teachers and for kids. That's your war room where you're figuring out how to solve this thing called American education and make it be all that we know that it can be. I had the benefit of always having at least one adult in my life, whether it was at the YMCA or whether it was in my high school who really believed in my possibilities, even when I didn't believe in myself, you know? And I think it makes a difference. The kids that I first taught as sixth graders are now in their 40s. It's completely surreal, Mitchell. <laughs> And, you know, because of social media, I have the privilege of being connected to a lot of my former students. Um, and I feel proud about the fact that many of my students can say unequivocally that even when they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, I always had an encouraging word. You know, I used to say to young people, I'm going to respond to you, not as you're showing up in this moment, but I'm gonna to respond to you as the young person that I know you're gonna become and blossom in. So when you get on my nerves, I'll be able to get over it, right? Because <laughs> I know the good stuff is coming down the road. So that's a little bit of what I would like to share. Solid advice and I just, I love it because I think kids need, want, they need, like you said, that one person that goes beside them and, and, and truly believes in them and loves them when they don't believe in them themselves or you know, they, maybe they try and tell themselves that, but they have that adult that, that they respect and, and love that's telling them the same thing. Like kids need that. And that doesn't, I feel like that even goes into adulthood pretty good. Like if, if adults, if they're always believing in an adult, they're like, well, what am I even, what's my point? Like, what's the point of doing this? So we gotta, we just, I'm a, we all have our moments in the middle, right? Yeah. I'm not always performing at a hundred percent. I don't always have the energy. You know, I get discouraged just like anybody else. So it's nice to, you know, have a board that supports my vision and leadership and can encourage me in moments when I'm feeling like, oh my God, like, you know, the money's not coming in or whatever the issue is. You know, I think everybody needs to, to show up as a champion for somebody else, whether it's at your workplace or in a school building, wherever you are. You know, that's how we, you know, make the world a better place. We want to complicate it and fix everything all at once. But, you know, if we just act like decent human beings, you'd be surprised how far we could go. And it costs zero dollars to show love and encouragement to people. And that goes so far. It goes so long. Uh -huh. we can... Yep, you make a good point. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about funding? It's, it's completely free. <laughs> Being a decent human being is free. <laughs> And it, I feel like it pays, it pay, definitely pays more to do that than to do the opposite because then it's a negative effect. So it's a win, it's a win-win. Dr. Danielle, it's been an absolute pleasure. I love what you're doing. I love that you've just been pouring into the next generation for years and you're continuing to do that. So I just want to encourage you and say thank you for what you're doing and your team and what you've built around you. So uh, I hope I can make it up there one day to, to, to New York. I'd love to see the office yes. and what you guys are doing. Uh, I'm happy to take you to lunch when you get here, you and your wife or whoever you end up traveling with. If it's for business, you know where to find me and, and we'll make sure we treat you right. All right I love it. Well,
Well, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, I'm so excited to finally meet you and interview you and wishing you and your team and everything, nothing but the best. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to, you know, be a part of your platform. This is, these are important conversations. Congratulations on your podcast. And I wish you nothing but continued success. Well, another huge shout out and a thank you to Dr. Danielle for taking time and being on the podcast today, wishing her and her team nothing but the best as they continue to pour into that next generation that's coming behind us and giving them an opportunity to get to that next level with nothing but success. So Dr. Danielle, continue to do what you're doing. You're doing amazing, amazing things. And you listeners, all right, this podcast is for you. I'm hoping that you guys can take at least one thing from today's episode that you can take back to your school to make it better than it is right now. I call you guys school success makers because that's what you guys are. You are school success makers looking to make your school better than it is right now. And I'm wanting to help come beside you to do that. And maybe it's helping you grow enrollment if you're struggling with that currently or finding ways to connect with the families that are enrolled or looking to enroll in your school. I would love to help you navigate that world a little bit better. You can find out more at schoolsuccessmakers.com. That's schoolsuccessmakers.com. Or join our free private Facebook community just for school leaders. I'm in there personally, and I'd love to see you in there as well. It's called School Success Makers right there on Facebook. Just go for groups and look at School Success Makers. I'd love to see you in there just for school leaders. You guys are awesome. Continue to do what you're doing. You're pouring into the next generation, and I love what you guys are doing. So keep doing it, all right? You're doing awesome. And we'll be here next week with another awesome guest on the School Success Podcast. We'll see you then. 